Uh, <coughs> take a look at a couple of problems in chapter 30 to begin today. And uh, I think the ones in the problem set are pretty straightforward. Um, the examples we did the other day should be a pretty good example. But I want to pull one from the book. So here's, and uh, I'm not going to pull it exactly from the book, I'm just going to pull it from the book the way I remember it. And here's the problem. It looks like this. The wire coming in here, there's a loop like this, and out of here.
into or out of the page? Into the page. By the right hand row. So point in the direction of the current. And everything below this current is going to be into the page, including part of the page. All right. Look at segment number two. We have this curve segment coming around like this. Radius R equal to two meters, and we want to find magnetic field. Use that segment, current uh, 7 amps. So for curve segment, we have that's equal to mu naught i or 4 pi r times theta. But theta is the angle of the curvature in radians. So this will be 4 pi times 10 minus 7 times 7 amps. 4 pi. Radius of this curvature is 2, and theta is 2 pi. <coughs> 7 times pi times 10 minus 7. Or out of the page. Into the page. So do this same right hand rule. And as you go around, it'll be into the page all the way around. Or you could use the other right hand rule. It says that if you curl your fingers in the direction of the current, the loop, there'd be a field through the center in the direction of your thumb. That would be into the page as well. So either right hand rule would work.
into or out of the page? Into the page. So all these fields were in the same direction. They're all into the page. So our total field would be the sum of all these fields. And so we got uh, 3.5 times 10 minus 7, 3.5 times 10 minus 7, plus 2.2 .2 times 10 minus 6. So this is going to be 2.9 times 10 minus 6. Each 
two long straight parallel wires separated by a distance of 16 centimeters carries a current of 20 amps in the same direction. What's the magnitude of the resulting magnetic field at a point that is 10 centimeters from each wire? All right, so let's do it this way. Let's have, let's have the two currents carry current out towards you. So I have, this would be current I1 and I have current I2 over here. The two wires are separated by 16 centimeters. Exactly, it could be exactly along that, that line there. I thought we had to see. Okay, so we actually have two fields here vec vectorally, and it's not, uh, not clear how we're going to add those. Right. Um, so let's, let's find the magnitude of those fields first. Since we have an infinitely long wire, it's going to be mu naught i over 2 pi r. We don't have to use the Osobar law, we use Ampere's law because it's infinitely long. And times 4 pi times 2 minus 7 times 20 amps over 2 pi times 0.1, or radius 0.1 away. That is going to be four times ten to the minus six divided by point one. Four times ten to the minus five. Okay. 
that interior out of the page goes from along this direction like this. And so let's keep that in mind. What about uh, magnetic field two? U dot I two over two pi R two. Same sort of thing that four pi times ten minus seven. Twenty amps. Two pi same radius. So the same magnitude four times ten minus five times the This one is going up this way, and this one's coming down this way. Okay. Well, if I look at this uh, first triangle here. Break up B1 into components, I would have that B1 would be equal to, um, we have one component of the x directions coming back this way. So it would be a negative 4 times 10 minus 5 times the cosine of 90 minus theta in the i direction. So 
también. Let's do, uh, let's do the other field, shall we? If we look at the other field, we're looking at, here's where the current is, going over 0 0.08 this way, 0 0.06 this way, 0.1. I've got a field coming down like this. This is a 90 degree angle right there. Like that. It's got to be tangential to that circle. It's got to be 90 degrees from the radius to that point. And uh, so, if uh, the same thing, if this were theta, that means this angle right here would be 90 minus theta. And since that's the right angle there, that means this angle right here. Cosine 9 minus theta is the same as 4 3 fifths. Sine 9 minus theta is 4 fifths. So that's going to be equal to 0 0.6 times 4 or negative 2.4 times 10 minus 5 i minus 3.2 times 10 minus 5. said, what is the magnitude of the result of the magnetic field? Well, you know, we just have one vector. The magnitude of this vector would be 4.8 times 10 minus 5 Tesla. Yes. That was the 
little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. <coughs>
about sunscreen and that stuff, but I didn't have to deal with the cell This would be the current through the cell phone. So let's figure out what that is. That's going to be 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. Number of charge per length was given, which was kind of nice, 960 charge per meter. And we have 0.3 amps going through the solenoid. I get 3.62 times 10 minus 4. That's my next question. 3.62 times 10 minus 4 Tesla. And so Sam, what is what is the direction? Oh. Uh, it's arbitrary. It's either up or down through the windings. So I'm going to get it. I'm going to say it's going down. So what would, would that make the direction through the solenoid? To the right. Yes, to the right. But by the solenoid right hand row. Curl your fingers in the direction of the linings. Your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. Or you have these loops like this. Thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. So this magnetic field is to the right. All right, so that, that part's done. Now we'll do the wire. Current in the wire is given as 12 amps. And we're going to look at some point P. That's two centimeters away from the wire. So uh, that magnetic field from Ampere's law is mu naught i over 2 pi r, r being the distance we are away from that wire. Bring more substrate down in there. So this is going to be 4 pi times 10 minus 7 times 12 amps over 2 pi times 2 centimeters. Zero two meters. So I get one point two times ten minus four Tesla. direction is that would go? All the pages we're looking at. It's, it's going around this wire like that. And as you're looking at it, it's coming out of the page at that moment. So let's do that. superimpose these results. So we've got one field that's going to the right. That's the magnetic field in the solenoid. And that's equal in magnitude. You could write as a vector 3.62 to the minus 4. Let's put a little i on there just because I wrote that as a vector. And then we have another field that's coming out towards you.
So the magnitude of this field is going to be equal to the magnitude of the solenoid square plus the magnitude of the wire field in the square. That's going to be 3.62 squared plus 1.2 squared square root times 10 minus 4. switch at the right time, 
in order to complete that circuit of that wire and run a current through that wire. And uh, also connected to this loop of iron is another loop over here that's connected to a meter here. And there's no battery in the meter or anything like that. It's just a meter is a deflection coil. It's going to just tell you whether or not a current is flowing in that wire. But it's not a source of current itself. It's just a meter. And what we find is something very interesting. When I close the switch and I run the current into this coil over here, I find that this meter over here will deflect. but only momentarily. I close that switch, the meter over here deflects like this, and it comes back to zero. Interesting. But what I've noticed then is that electric current is induced by a changing magnetic field. In other words, there is no electrical connection between this first coil and the second coil. There is no uh, pure electric connection that would say the electrons would go from one to the other. They are separated. And there's no electricity flowing through the iron. Right? So you don't get electricity going from one coil to the other. What you do get is magnetic flux flowing through the iron. And so what this does is when the first current goes into this first coil, it causes, like a solenoid, it causes a magnetic field through the center of that coil. That magnetic field is carried as magnetic flux through the second coil over here. And the action of that flux going through the second coil causes a current to be induced in that second coil, which runs and deflects the meter. But only when I first close the switch. If I were to open the switch suddenly, it will also deflect. I'm not going to tell you why yet. Let's look at another example. Here's a, a similar idea, at least in, in what we're talking about here. We have a meter and we have a coil. And we have a magnet, a magnet uh, coming towards that coil. And I'm going to push this magnet towards this coil. What's going to happen? Well, as I push it towards the coil, I'll find that this meter will deflect. There's actually no electrical connection. In fact, there's no electricity in this magnet. There's no electrical connection between the magnet and the coil itself. They're in free space. But as I push this magnet towards this coil, this meter will deflect, indicating that there is a current flowing in this circuit over here. But only when I'm moving the magnet. When I stop moving the magnet at any point, there's no deflection. If I push the magnet in, there's a deflection. If I pull the magnet out, there's a deflection. Only when I'm moving the magnet. Interesting. Take a look at this. We have a coil here. We have a meter here. I have a magnet, not a very powerful magnet. So this is not going to be very impressive. But I have a magnet here. And if I push this in, it deflects the meter. It's not touching it. I'm going to pull it out, it deflects the meter. So anytime I move it, it deflects. I shouldn't have to move that fast. Anytime I stop, it basically doesn't deflect. So it's only when I change the motion of this magnet that it deflects. Bringing up a basic principle that if you change a magnetic field, you will induce a current if it's possible. And the reason you induce a current is because nature is opposed to the change. Something that nature likes to do in science. It's a basic principle of nature and science. That nothing really interesting happens in science 
unless you try to change something. All right? In other words, in, in physics, in mechanics, right, an object will move at constant velocity in a straight line forever and ever and ever, unless acted on by a force. So if you see an object moving in a straight line forever and ever, and all of a sudden it changes its motion, you say, ah, there's a force there. That's kind of interesting. Because it doesn't change its motion, no forces. Right? That, I mean, obviously, that's, I'm saying that's, that's a physics example. But here's a, a biological example. If you have an ecosystem, and nothing ever changes in your ecosystem, like your conditions are always the same. You know, you get the same amount of water, same amount of sunlight, same temperature, variation all the time. Then, from a biological standpoint, that ecosystem won't really evolve much. I mean, you might have some mutations going on, but over time, you basically would have the same ecosystem forever and ever and ever. It's only when you put stress on the ecosystem, when, you know, the, there's a drought or suddenly gets hotter or um, maybe more rainfall that only those species that can adapt to that stress survive and, and procreate and go on and the ones that can't handle that die and all of a sudden your species start changing. Right? At least that's what I would say if I were a biologist. But see, I'm not a biologist, so I didn't say that. But the only, only thing only time that it becomes interesting is when nature is trying to deal with the change. Right? Then it becomes interesting. So, this principle is this. We got the status quo, nothing's happening. All of a sudden, a flux comes in that's changing. What is happening is by moving this magnet in like this, I'm increasing the flux in that direction as I move it towards the coil. If nature has the ability, it will try to maintain the status quo. It'll try to avoid the change. It'll try to, to uh, mitigate the stress that's being put on the system. So what nature does is try to create a flux that's in the opposite direction. And to do that requires that it must flow a current through this coil to create a flux in the opposite direction. As it's creating that flux in the opposite direction, it flows a current, and we can see that deflection on there. But only when it's trying to oppose a change. So as this comes in, it's trying to oppose a change. The current flows in the opposite direction. We see the deflection. But if this is the status quo now, no change. But if I change it, the current flows in the opposite direction, to avoid that change, and current flows. Basic principle of nature. Nature opposes change, if it can. So, we pull the magnet away, we're actually decreasing the flux, and the direction to the left. Well, nature already got used to it the way it was, so it creates its own flux in that direction to try to mitigate the change, try to keep things the way they were. So it starts creating a flux in the direction uh, that the magnetic field is going, and hence that requires a current by the right hand rule that would be going around like this, and that causes the opposite deflection on the meter. observations lead to what is called Faraday's Law, and it looks like this. The EMF induced, or otherwise the voltage induced, is equal to the negative number of turns in the coil times the change in flux over the change in time, change in magnetic flux over the change in time. So the voltage induced is equal to the negative number of turns 
uh, the change in magnetic flux from the chain. There it is, Bob. The voltage is induced if the flux changes. Then the end factor allows for the fact that you could have more than one loop. And the negative sign is Lenz's law. The negative sign means the nature is opposing the change. So you have a flux going on, and the induced voltage is because it's opposing that change. And that little negative sign has Lenz's name on it. So all you have to do is say, up, oh, and put that negative sign out front, get a law named after me. Lenz's law. <coughs> Faraday got the full law, and Lenz, Lenz got that negative sign. That's his point. <coughs> well, how can we use this to our advantage? Well, we would recognize that, uh, first of all, just like in electric flux, you have magnetic flux. We could represent magnetic flux by arrows. So the density of these arrows, these lines, would indicate how strong the flux was, and would also indicate the direction of the flux, the magnetic flux. So for instance, if I had a loop that was oriented as shown, we're just looking at a cross section of this loop. So the loop's kind of like this. I would have full flux going through this loop at this moment. Right? I got all my lines going through the loop. But if I were to uh, turn the loop, say to this orientation here, so that loop comes down flat like that, at this moment, I would have no flux lines going through the loop. They all would be going parallel to the orientation of the loop, and none of those flux lines would actually be going through the loop itself. So I could change, by, by turning this loop, I could go from maximum flux to no flux just by turning it 90 degrees. So the flux is proportional to the number of lines. And, and in fact, if I want to quantify this for a planar loop, I would say that uh, if I represent the loop by an area vector and the magnetic field by a magnetic field B vector and the angle between the two is theta, then the flux is quantified through that planar loop as the field times the area times the cosine of the angle between the two of them. We did a similar thing with electric flux back in chapter 24. So we're going to say that the flux through a planar loop is field times the area of the loop times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So now I could say by Faraday's law that the average voltage induced will be equal to the negative number of turns times the change in flux over change in time. But if, I, if it were a planar area, then that change in flux is going to be the change of the field times the area times the cosine of the angle between them or the change in time. In other words, we get a voltage through this loop, if the magnetic field changes, if the area changes, or the angle changes, or any combination of the above. Great. What this means is if I have a loop in the vicinity of a magnetic field, if I change the magnetic field, I'm going to get a voltage and a current. If I change the area of the loop, I'm going to get a voltage and a current. If I change the orientation of the loop, I'm going to get a voltage and a current. The basic principle of power generation, the basic principle of generating electricity for everything for all of us to use. All I need to do is change the flux somehow, I get a current. It. So I have to do one of those three things or a combination of those three things. 
Let's try this out in the problem here. This is example 31.1. The coil consists of 200 turns of wire having a total resistance of 2 ohms. Each turn is a square of side 18 centimeters and a uniform magnetic field is directed perpendicular to the plane and is turned on. If the field changes linearly from 0 to 0.5 tesla in 0.8 seconds, what is the magnitude of the induced EMF in the coil while the field is changing? All right, so we have this coil, it's a square coil, 200 turns, but it's square like this, and we have a magnetic field going through it, so we have a flux going through it. But we're going to change that magnetic field from 0 to 0.5 tesla in 0.8 seconds, so we're going to change the magnetic field. Area is not going to change, orientation is not going to change. But the field will change. By Faraday's law, the voltage induced will be equal to the negative number of turns times the change in flux over the change in time. But the area is not going to change, so we'll take that out of the delta up here. And the angle is not going to change. The angle is um, 90 degrees. Okay? No, 0 degrees. Because, well, 0 or 180, which you know, how you look at it because the area vector is going to be perpendicular to that coil. So the cosine is zero, so that'll be one. So we'll have a number of turns times the area times the change in the magnetic field over change of time. This will be negative 200 turns. The area of that coil is going to be 0.18 meters on the side. So this is a square. And our final magnetic field is 0.5. Our initial magnetic field was zero. And we did it all in 0.8 seconds. So this will induce a negative 4.1 volts or a magnitude of 4.1 volts in that coil. Part B, what is the magnitude of the induced current in the coil while the fuel is changing? Well, that was the voltage induced. The current will be the voltage divided by the resistance. 4.1 volts divided by 2 ohms, rounded up or rounded to 2 amps. So we will induce 2 amps of current in that clock. What direction will that current be? Well, we can look at this, trying to utilize that negative sign, that Lenz's law idea. This is what's happening, is that the magnetic field is increasing into the board. It's going from 0 to 0.5. So what's happening in nature is that this coil is experiencing an increase in flux that's into the page this way. Nature's response to that is trying to mitigate that, trying to maintain the status quo the way it is. So nature will set up its own flux out of the page towards you. In order to create that flux, a current would have to flow in this coil that would be counterclockwise by the right hand row. So the current flowing in this coil oops, is counterclockwise. Actually, the other transfer, electrical energy into heat, 
heat up the filament, and then getting light. So, that efficient, but still possible, right? And in this day of energy awareness, things like that are, are good to think about. Well, one of the keys to all of this is let's love. Because we're, like I said, the idea is that nature is opposing the change that you're producing and is trying to mitigate that change. So Lenz's Law is the opposition to that change. It's so important that we'll restate it here in pure English. The polarity of the induced EMF is such that it tends to produce a current that will create a magnetic flux to oppose the change of magnetic flux through the wind. In other words, it's the minus sign. <laughs> But we want to be able to recognize this change. So this is an important little section to recognize length of law. And so to determine the direction of an induced current in a loop, one should ask the following list of questions. This list of questions is something I've come up with. I don't think it's in your book. So it's just what I say is your hierarchy of decision making and trying to figure out what direction the current should be flowing. So here's the questions you should ask. First of all, is in what direction is the flux through the loop? So as you're proceeding through a problem, just decide what is the direction of the flux through the loop? Is it that way or this way or what is it doing? Just decide that first. Then ask this question. Is that flux increasing or decreasing? So first you decide what direction it's going. And then once you decide that, as you proceed through that problem, is it increasing in that direction or decreasing in that direction? Once you decide what the flux is doing, whether it's increasing or decreasing in a particular direction, then you decide what nature is going to do to oppose that. So question three is, in what direction is the induced magnetic field to oppose this increase or decrease? Nature will set up an induced field to oppose what's happening. So if there happens to be a flux that direction and it's increasing, nature will set up a flux this direction to oppose it. <coughs> and the last is, by the right hand rule, what is the direction of the induced current need to produce that induced field? And that would be, once you decide where the induced field is, you'd have to look at how the circuit is set up and use the right hand rule to set up your direction of your current. Example. I've got a solenoid and a battery and a switch and another coil over here. When I close the switch, it will complete this circuit and the current will run through this circuit from the positive end of the battery to the negative end of the battery. So as it comes in here, it will go upward through either all these coils in this solenoid. The current's flowing up on this far left end, then it will flow upward in every succeeding coil in that solenoid. So that's one thing. I'm going to close that switch, and the current will flow upward in all those coils. Hence, by the right hand rule for a solenoid, there will be a magnetic, a magnetic field through the center of that solenoid that's going to the left. Current going upward through the coils, plus to the left. So this magnetic field is coming around here. So basically, the left hand side of the solenoid would be your north pole where the flux is coming out, and the right hand side is where the flux is coming in because the magnetic field is going to the left. So we have flux lines that are coming in on this side, and in the vicinity of this coil, that means this coil had no flux going through it, and all of a sudden, it's got flux coming into it from uh, right to left, right? That's what it's experiencing. <coughs> so you had nothing, and all of a sudden there's something. 
Well, nature doesn't like that change, right? If it, if it can avoid it or mitigate it. So since this coil is by itself, all of a sudden experiencing this flux coming in like this, that separate coil will set up its own flux in the opposite direction to oppose that increase from right to left. So it will set up a field in that direction requiring a current flowing around its loop like this out towards you. So there's the original magnetic field. Nature will set up a magnetic field in the opposite direction. Imposed an increase in flux that was right to left, and that requires a current that's flowing. It's hard to see this three dimensional, but that's flowing out like this. That's, that's what that's supposed to look like. Current right hand. Side. If I were to open that switch all of a sudden, then the flux that was going from right to left all of a sudden has gone to zero. So that would be the flux direction, but then all of a sudden now it's decreasing. Right? Well, nature got used to it, right? And now it's going to oppose that change. And the way to oppose that change is to set up a field in that same direction to, to help uh, supplement the field that was there to try to maintain it the way it was. Make sense? So it sets a field in that direction to try to mitigate that decrease, and that requires a current in the opposite direction through this coil like this. So as I open the switch, the flux will decrease in that direction. The induced field will be in the same direction to try to help supplement it. The current will be in the opposite direction as what we saw before. As I open and close the switch, the current will flow one way and then the other way. Take a look at this situation. It's probably a little bit clearer to see. We have a coil with a resistor. The resistor is in the part of the coil that's furthest, closest to you. All right. So we're thinking of this three-dimensional with this coil like this, with the resistor on the front end, closest to you. I'm going to drop a magnet through this coil. Now, I've oriented the magnet so that the south pole actually is at the bottom of the magnet. North pole's at the top. Right. And the question is, as this magnet is falling towards this coil, in what direction would the induced current be in this separate separate coil down here? Right. Well, to answer that, you, you already have an answer for that? So, so. Well, um, it's got to be, either be right to left or left to right. Okay. Eventually, we're going to come up with a, what direction the current flowing in this loop. And it's, this loop is like this. Well, we, we should be asking the other questions first. So that's what we're going to do first. 
in your right. Uh, so the first question is, in what direction is the magnetic flux, what direction is the magnetic field in our situation here? And Sosim said up. Uh, does everyone agree? Our said she's right. So you should agree. <laughs> Up, up it is, because we have magnetic field coming out of the North Pole here and coming in to the South Pole here. So the flux lines are going into the South Pole. The direction of the magnetic flux is up, right? as, as this coil is experiencing it. Right? So we do have flux lines going up through that coil. That's the answer to the first question. What is the direction of the flux? We're not even thinking about what, what's happening dynamically. We're just thinking about what is the direction of the flux. Yes or no? Right? Upward or down? The second question is the dynamics. As we're looking at this flux, and as we proceed through this problem with this magnet falling towards that second coil, does that flux increase or decrease? Decreases? You're thinking too hard and you're answering the next one before you answer this one. So just think, think uh, really basic. As it gets closer, it increases. As it gets closer, it increases. As it gets closer, we're getting closer to the pole where the density of the flux lines is, is much greater. So we're going from lesser density to a higher density. It's increasing as this magnet is getting closer. Right? So that's your answer to the first two questions. As this magnet is falling towards this coil, the flux is going up and it's increasing. Once you figure that out, forget about the magnet and just think about what's happening with the coil. The coil is like this. It's experiencing a flux that's going up and increasing. What's nature's reaction to that? To set up its own field in the opposite direction because it wants to try to maintain things the way they were. So it's going to set its own field that's down. And to do that would require a current that is flowing by right hand rule, right to left to this position. As you're looking at it. So that's all this explanation here. The direction of the flux is going up. The flux is increasing because we're getting close to the end of the magnet. The induced field will be down because it wants to oppose that flux increase. And that means, by the right-hand rule, the induced current must be right to the left to the resistor. So the resistor is closest to you. Good? What happens if the magnet falls all the way through the coil and now is on the other side of the coil continuing to fall? The question is, what is the direction of the current through that coil now? Your intuition is probably right. Well, let's, um, let's go through the hierarchy of questions just to prove it. All right, so, first question is, what is the direction of the flux, up or down? to kind of supplement that decrease and try to keep things the way they were. Right? 
So it will set up its own field as up. That requires a current that's flowing left to right through the resistor, by the right hand. It would, uh, you're talking about the uh, induced current? Induced current would be greatest right when this magnet first passed through because that's when the change is greatest. So as this continues to fall further and further away, that current, the change experienced by the flux will be smaller and smaller and the current will get smaller and smaller. So it will be the largest right when it first passes through, less and less and less as it falls. Does that answer the question? Basically, that's what's happening with this thing, though, because there's a coil there, and I'm just pushing the magnet up and down through that coil and generating electricity one way and then the other way, but it's, it's, it's charging up, and uh, that's how I get this to work. All right, good. Learn today the concept more important than 
create a nuclear bomb and you can learn to hold that together. More important than that, because you learn how to generate electricity. Okay. There's a basic principle of nature that if you have a coil and you want to use Lenz's law, you can generate electricity by doing one of three things. Change the magnetic field through the coil, change the area of the coil, or change its orientation with respect to that magnetic field. Most of the time, when we're generating electricity, we change the orientation. In other words, if you had a power plant at the bottom of a uh, waterfall, right? The key there is you have a large magnet at the bottom, so you just have a constant magnetic field, and you have a coil of constant area. So those two things aren't going to change, but your basic idea is to move that coil. So you move that coil, you rotate it through that magnetic field, and by rotating it, you're constantly generating these opposing currents. Those opposing currents is the electricity that eventually goes to to power the city. If it's hydroelectric power. Or, or if it were a um, coal burning power plant. Does anyone know how a coal, bur coal burning power plant would work? There's a heat. How, and what do you do with the heat? It's water. And water, what do you do with water? Yeah, a coal burning power plant, you, you burn the coal to heat water into steam. The pressure of the steam gets so great that you use that pressure to turn the turbine to move the coil in a magnetic field. A constant magnetic field with a constant area coil, so the steam is just pushing that coil, and that movement changes the orientation of the coil, generates electricity. Doesn't sound very efficient, but that's the way it works. That's how you do in Israel. Do you, use, do you burn coal? I didn't know that. Burn coal? I thought it was nuclear. No. I was a nuclear plant worker. You have a nuclear reaction, creates heat, heats water into steam. Steam, pressure of the steam turns up the turbine, generates electricity. In other words, it's the basic, same basic idea, right? Just a different source for your initial heat. But the whole idea is to turn the turbine in, in a magnetic field to generate electricity, where nature is opposing that change. More on this next time. But uh, let's, uh, let's stop there today. Oh, it's X-credit. Yeah. Okay. This X-credit that I've handed out to you is worth an uh, X-credit problem on the next test. So possible five points on the next test. Okay. Um, and you can use anything at your disposal except anybody who's taking this course before and not giving this X-credit. So John, I'm sorry, you cannot help anybody okay. unless they really pay you well. <laughs> and, unless I get a kickback. I'm sure. So um, you can probably use the internet and it probably would help you on some of this. But here's the idea. You are to calculate using mathematical methods what the um, resistance is from say an edge of a cube of resistors. It's a cube of resistor. There is um, 12 resistors forming a cube. And there, but if I were to put leads on an edge, I would get a different resistance as opposed to putting leads on a face diagonal or a body diagonal. In other words, in each case, I have if I were on the edge, I'd have one resistor in parallel with everything else, so to speak. If I put it on a face diagonal, I'd have this side in parallel with that side. The problem is, none of these resistors are in series, and none of them are in parallel. So you can't use, immediately you can't use 
your basic series parallel formula. So I tell you what you can't use? Do you mind me going over a couple minutes here and explaining this? Can you a copy of the problem? Yeah. Does everybody have a copy of this? We want to find the equivalent resistance between points A and B of this circuit here. So the problem is, if you were to approach this by series parallel formulas, you wouldn't be able to do anything. Because none of these resistors are in series, none of them are in parallel, anything else. So you can't do anything. Except that, you would notice, let's call this point C and this point B, that if I did have a current coming in here from the input, I'd go one ohm this way to point C, I go one ohm this way to point D, as far as the input is concerned, C and D are equivalent. It looks no different to the input, C and D. And if I look at it from the opposite side, I'm one ohm this way from B and one ohm this way from D and everything else being the same, C and D look the same to point B as well. So to the input and the output, those two points look exactly the same which means, by all practical purposes, by symmetry, they should be at the same potential. And if something's at the same potential, you might as well just short them together, because they're at the same potential anyway. So, we can imagine that if C and D are at the same potential, we might as well just short them together, connect them together, and if we did that, this five ohms would be inconsequential, and this would look like this. If you can do that with this thing, 
if you look at, say if I were to put it on both ends of an edge, if I could find points that look the same to this point as an input, and also look the same to this point as an output, then those points must be at the same potential, and I can connect them together. And when I do, it simplifies this problem. And I would do the same thing if I put my inputs along a face diagonal, find two points or three points that are at the same potential, or a body diagonal. I can use the same method. There's an alternate method here that might, for those of you who like mathematics, might be even easier. And that is the delta y transformation. We can take a delta. If you have three resistors like this, R, A, B, and C. So you have some configuration that looks like that. You can transform that into a Y configuration. R1, 2, and 3 <coughs> by using those mathematical, you, you run through the same three points. And now you transform it from one into, into the other. R1, R2, and R3. By using those equations, in other words, uh, I did a delta y transformation where I knew R A, R B, and R C. I would take uh, actually it's I want to create R one, which would be like this. I want to create this network here, like this. The R one being right there. I would take the product of these two over the sum of these three. So that would be R1. And I would get R2 by taking the product of these two over the sum of the three. And I would get R3 by taking the product of these two over the sum of the three. So I can transform one network into a different network, which once I do that transformation, then maybe I can use series of parallel formulas after that. You don't like that? Um, it, it, this goes out of the category of giving you too much information. <coughs> but if, if, you, uh, if you want to look into it, look into it because I'll give you um, an opportunity to solve this problem. To help you along, I've got a meter here. I'm going to give you what the meter tells you are these respective answers. So it'll at least give you, let you know whether you're close or not. Because somebody has built one for me. They got the X credit by building one for me. So it's already been done. So. But this is, um, these resistors are 10 kilo ohm resistors. So, or 100 kilo ohm resistors. What size resistors did I tell you? Yeah. 10 kilo ohms. I think they go these with, um, these are 100 kilo ohm resistors. So if they were 10 kilo ohm resistors, this would be your answer. The resistance of an edge, at least for measurement standpoint, is 5.75 kilo ohms. I look at a body diagonal, what I'm measuring is 7.39, I'm sorry, face diagonal, 7.39 kilo ohms. And I look at a body diagonal.
the measuring 8.23. These measurements could be slightly off. But, uh, yeah, but those resistors have tolerances. That's not actual that's what I mean. calculations on paper. Exactly. So that's why. So that's why these are not your pure answers. But they should be close to what you get in the computer calculations. Yeah, they could be off. Plus or minus ten. Ten percent. Five percent. Yeah. These are high precision. Paul would be the uh, soldering gun. Let's uh, let's give you the uh, Thanksgiving weekend. So uh, the day after the Thanksgiving weekend, the day we come back on Monday, the first of December. I have that as well. Uh, I say the seven first. So we won't, we won't see it until then. That'd be the next 